Everyone, it's Pastor Justin here, and I'm coming to you with our next video in our series on the Presbyterian Church USA Book of Confessions. We've been making our way into this book that's full of confessions and creeds and declarations and statements of faith, and we come to the middle section of the Book of Confessions to one that is called the Second Helvetic Confession. Technically, this is the longest confession in the Book of Confessions. However, when you put a, all of the Westminster standards together, it's actually longer as a whole. But it is a lot of, uh, a lot of statements about doctrine and theology and the way that faith relates to life as well as how the church relates to the world. And so there's a lot in here. Helvetic, uh, if you don't know, is nothing more than a uh, Latin word that refers to the Swiss or Switzerland, right? And so um, that's where that comes from. And uh, the, the whole thing was basically written by a man um, named Heinrich. Uh, Bullinger. Let me check to make sure I got his name spelled right. Actually, it's Heinrich with an I right there. Bullinger, okay. And um, what do you need to know about this? Several different things. One, uh, Bullinger took over for uh, Ulrich uh, Zwingli. Is that how you spell Zwingli? Make sure I got that right. Zwingli, yep. Okay, Z I L I, right there, okay. Zwingli was one of the founding fathers of the uh, Reformation along with Martin Luther, okay. Uh, so Bollinger comes in generation number two in the Reformation along with John Calvin, okay. And so I'm trying to give you a placement here in history of where all of this sits, okay? So Bollinger and um, Calvin are kind of generation two. Zwingli and Luther are generation one in this. Um, both of these folks, Bollinger and Calvin, um, have immense amount of influence on the Reformation itself, partly because they are generation two, and so um, they're no longer having to fight necessarily the battles that Zwingli and Luther had to fight, particularly politically, as well as what that meant with violence and stuff. And so Calvin and Bollinger both get to exist in relative peace, relative being the key term right here, particularly Bollinger. Um, and he's a pastor. He's a preacher. His chief and primary role in the church and life is serving as a pastor, particularly to other pastors um, in his life and so one of the gifts that he wanted to leave the church was a confession that could spread across all of the reformed churches what we would now call across all of protestantism okay and so what he writes is comprehensive and so that's one of the reasons why the second helvetic confession is so large because it literally uh, is trying to cover so many different areas once again, because he is writing in the second generation of the Reformation, things have developed, right? The church is relatively at peace at this point, and so it can focus on much, much broader scope, a more comprehensive scope of what is going on, okay? And so there are 30 chapters in the second Helvetic Confession. And when I say it's comprehensive, I mean it really is comprehensive. I want to read the first uh, line of the second Helvetic Confession because it just jumps right in to theology. Unlike what we've uh, seen so far, it doesn't start with flower, flowery language about God. It doesn't start with um, some great polemic. It just jumps right into theology. So, second Helvetic Confession, chapter one of the Holy Scripture being the true word of God. 
Heading, Canonical Scripture. We believe and confess the canonical scriptures of the holy prophets and apostles of both testaments to be the true word of God, and to have sufficient authority of themselves, not of men. For God himself spoke to the fathers, prophets, apostles, and still speaks to us through the holy scriptures. And in this holy scripture, the universal church of Christ has the most complete exposition of all that pertains to a saving faith and also to the framing of a life acceptable to God. And in this respect, it is expressly commanded by God that nothing be either added to or taken from the same. I read all that because I want to give you the tone of this confession right here, okay? It jumps right in to the theology. It jumps right into the doctrine um, and spells out in very clear terms what the Reformers believed about the Holy Scriptures, right? So, a couple things here. One, in comparison to the other confessions that we've come to so far, uh, this is quite a different intro both in tone as well as in content, okay? In tone, obviously, just jumping right in, no flowery language. In content, in that it starts with Scripture, not with God. Do you hear me there? It starts with what do we believe about the written word, not with God and God's self, right? And so both with the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed, we start with, you know, we believe or I believe in God the Father Almighty, right? Apostles' Creed, the maker of heaven and earth, and Jesus Christ is the only Son, our Lord, right? Um, when we got into the Scots Confession, when we were in Heidelberg, we're starting with sentences about the nature of who God is. But by the second Helvetic Confession we are having a, a major shift. We're going to start with the written word of God, okay? And this is one of the things that become a huge piece within the Reformed faith, within Protestantism, is what is the nature of the word of God, okay? And so a couple of things here is what happens in modern-day theology, right? And essentially post uh, but within the Reformation as well as post-Reformation is that we begin to have a philosophical argument, okay, of how do we know? How do we know what we know, right? And so Christian Protestantism's answer to this is we have Scripture. We have the written word of God, okay? And as Hel the Second Helvetic Confession says here, as Bollinger says here, right? Um, we believe and confess that the canonical scriptures of the Holy Prophets and Apostles of both Testaments to be the true word of God and to have sufficient authority of themselves, not of men, okay? And so there's, there's a whole bunch that's being said there that what we know of God comes from the Old and New Testaments, what we know of God doesn't require the interpretation of men, of, of human beings, right? What we know of God can be wholly learned from the Holy Scriptures. Now, as we look at the breadth of the Book of Confessions, there's obviously um, a whole lot of agreement there, as well as a lot of divergence there as well. Um, both previous confessions as well as later confessions are going to talk about this sense of the Word of God being broader than just that, okay? And in fact, the Second Helvetic Confession does that same thing as well because it's one of the confessions that, uh, similar to the Scots Confessions, that talks about the preaching of the Word. Um, the Second Helvetic Confession literally comes in and says, the preaching of the Word of God is the Word of God. Wherefore, when this word of God is now preached in the church by preachers lawfully called, we believe that the very word of God is proclaimed and received by the faithful. Okay? So even within 2nd Helvetic, we got the written word. But we also have the spoken word. And both are the word of God. 
okay? And I want you to take notice of this because this is going to keep coming up in the Book of Confessions as, as the Reformers, as the Protestants, as us Presbyterians. Look at what does it mean to call something the Word of God? And what this is going to conclude with is in the Confession of 1967, which we'll deal with in many weeks from now, is that the Word of God gets defined as Jesus Christ and is attested to by the written word of Holy Scripture, of the Holy Bible, right? Um, and that that formula is going to be a, a slight difference from what we are seeing right here. Since Second Helvetic includes preaching as part of this word of God, in fact, not just preaching, but really any spoken word, of the Word being the Word of God. Um, it, it's in some ways restrictive and also very expansive all at the same time. What we get into is how do we identify truth, right? And that's why the Second Helvetic uh, Confession starts with Scripture and the Word of God first rather than talking about God right from the beginning, because it's trying to answer this question, how do we know what we know? And so the second Helvetic's conclusion to that is, we know what we know because we have this Word of God, which we find in the Holy Scriptures, in the Old and New Testaments, right? And those are the only thing that we need to know for our salvation. They're the only things that we need to know to have, uh, as it says, also to the framing of a life acceptable to God in this respect is expressly commanded by God that nothing be either added to or taken from the same. Okay? So there's this whole piece of we know what we know because there's a word of God, right? Now that we've established that, now, now and only now, can we say something about the rest of theology or about God, right? And so chapter 1's all about this sense of revelation from the Word of God. It goes from written word to spoken word, then gets into inner inward illumination um, and the external sense of preaching and how God works with us. Gets into some things about what is not Scripture. So the second Helvetic um, confession literally says that the Apocrypha, which are books that are found in the uh, Catholic and Orthodox Bibles, okay, are not actual scriptures. And so 5.009, Apocrypha. And yet we do not conceal the fact that certain books of the Old Testament were by the ancient authors called apocryphal, and by others ecclesiastical, in as, in as much as some would have them read in the churches, but not advanced as an authority from which the faith is to be established. As Augustine also in his De Civate Dei, book 18, chapter 38, remarks that in the books of the kings, the names in the books of certain prophets are cited. But he adds that they are not in the canon, and that those books which we have suffice unto godliness. Okay? I want to bring this up about the Apocrypha because it's going to come up in Westminster, okay? which is the next uh, group of confessions that we're going to deal with. So here in Helvetic, uh, Apocrypha definitely named as not the holy canon of scriptures, but also clearly um, ecclesiastical, clearly something that is good, right? When we get to Westminster, there's going to be much more of a condemnation of the Apocrypha and the Apocryphal books, right? And so um, we, I've already set that out. How do we know what we know? We know because we have these two testaments, the Word of God. They are sufficient in and of themselves according to Helvetic, okay? Then we get into how to interpret them, and this is where we get into church authority, okay? And we interpret them by uh, the church fathers. We would say the church fathers and mothers, the councils, the traditions, the history of the church, the councils of the church, all those different things, right? But once again, this is um, laying out a how do we know what we know. Within the Roman Catholic Church of this time, we know what we know because of God has given us a pope. God has given us a father. God has given us a priest, okay? And so the church 
literally the authority and interpretation and inspiration church flows through these human beings, right? From God to these people to us, the people in the pews, right? Within Protestantism, within the Reformation, this is shifted, right? We know what we know because we have a word of God. It has been written, is spoken about indeed by preachers and pastors, and that is the word of God. But it's also illuminated and interpreted by regular people who are reading, okay? And so Helvetic is trying to lay out this contrast between the Roman Catholic Church and Protestantism and the difference in how we approach God and how we know God, we know God through the Word of God. And this is part of our Protestant and Reformation tradition, that we know God through the Word of God, right? And as I said, in 1967, we're going to get that we know God through the Word of God made flesh in Jesus Christ, attested to by human beings in written and spoken word, right? But it's a reversal of process. Whew, that's a lot right there in and of itself, okay? But I want to jump into a few other things. We get into some major Reformation themes that are still part of Presbyterianism today. The sovereignty of God, okay? That God is above and over and more powerful than all other things. But it's not just about power and authority in Helvetic, okay? Like I said from the beginning, because Bollinger is a pastor, um, his... His interest in the providence and sovereignty of God is in the fact that God is caring for you and me. It's not just God is powerful. It's that God is powerful in the way that a parent is powerful and caring for a child, right? And that's how God's sovereignty relates to you and me. It is a caring power, okay? Alongside of sovereignty comes this doctrine that is often in conflict with it, human free will. Okay, and so within Protestantism, within Presbyterianism, within Calvinism, within the Bollingerism, essentially, right, there's this tension that is set up. If God is sovereign and powerful, where do human beings fit into this? If human beings have free will, then what does that do to the power of God? But because Bullinger is a pastoral genius, he relates these two things together through the care of God to us. So if God is sovereign and is caring for us, if God knows all the hairs of our head, as Matthew tells us, the Gospel of Matthew tells us, right? This power is not one of uh, coercion and of force. No, it's a power that's able to take hold of us and care for us in our free will in our ability to have um, a little sovereignty, essentially, ourselves, which sets us up for freedom, human freedom. And this is where Bollinger and Calvin really relate to one another. It's over this idea of freedom, of liberty, um, and, the, and the personal self that I, I am important. Right? And this relates to the Renaissance. I think, therefore, I am. I've referenced this before in talking about the book of Confessions, right? So back in Heidelberg, it's not so much that I matter in and of myself as much as it is how God relates to me. Yes, Heidelberg gets into me, the individual, the self, probably for the first time in the Reformation, but Helvetic lines out the kind of the philosophical underpinnings of it, right? There is an I. There is a self. That self has been endowed with liberty, with freedom, with free will that is relating to the caring power of the sovereign God, okay? And so as such, what is my responsibility to God? What is my responsibility in salvation? What is my responsibility to the church? What's my responsibility to the government? What's my responsibility to my family, right? And these are all topics that Helvetic gets into that Bollinger addresses as being this kind of senior pastor to multiple churches within the Swiss tradition and laying this whole thing out. That leads to this next common theological idea within uh, the Reformation, predest predestination, okay? 
What is the nature of predestination? And this is where Helvetic, I find, far more helpful than Westminster and a whole lot more helpful than some of the other confessions that didn't end up in the Book of Confessions that are very much about the some have been chosen, some have been damned kind of theology that we associate with predestination. One of the great things about predestination in the Helvetic Confession is that it clearly identifies that the purpose of predestination, of election, which is another word for it, is not just that we may be saved, but that God chose us in Christ, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. That's ultimately about our holiness. Not just our salvation, but our holiness. It's about our lives. It's about this self becoming a responsible self, that we use our freedom, our liberty, our power, our will for the good, okay? And what Bullinger does here in Helvetic is that he channels all this into the next section on our salvation. What is our relationship of our sin to Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ's sacrifice for us for our salvation, what is the relationship of our freedom, liberty, and will towards that? It's not that we earn salvation, right? And once again, this is a contrast that they're making in the Reformation with the Catholic Church. It's not that we're earning our salvation. It's not works-based, okay? For those of you who steeped kind of in the uh, classic Reformed tradition of grace versus works that have kind of been set up, Bollinger tells us, no, these works are out of the self, from our freedom and liberty and free will, towards a caring God, okay? We respond to that caring God with gratitude, right? That's how we receive God's grace. It's through our, our gratitude. It is reciprocal in that nature, right? It's, it's not transactional. We don't we don't earn God's grace and God's love, but instead, because God has grace upon us, we respond with gratitude out of our freedom and liberty, out of our true self. Okay, And so this is the theological nature that Helvetic, that Bollinger, sets up here. right? And so then that gets into a whole thing about the Christian faith and Christian life and how do we live our lives. And so there's huge chapters here in Helvetic about the inward Christian life, holiness and purity and living out of a good conscience towards God. In fact, there's so much written about the inward transformation of the self and our freedom and liberty being used towards God that there's what's missing in the Helvetic Confession is any sense of the world, right? What do we do about the world? What do we do about evangelism? What do we do about sharing of the gospel? There's very little of that here in Helvetic, okay? What that leads to then, of course, is not just only me, but my community, the church, and our relationship with one another. And what is our relationship then with one another, with the Word of God, and how does preaching interact with the sacraments, particularly communion? And so Helvetic has this huge section about the sacraments and how to administer them in a right and true way, which is still one of the biggest marks of the Reformation all these years later. So much so, as I've mentioned in other videos, that a preacher, a pastor within the Reformed tradition is called a, a um, minister of word and sacrament. Okay, And so that's how all of those things relate. And so then it gets into all these marks of a true and good minister, which is the first confession to really get into all of that. And then it begins to relate to everyday life, including family life, particularly what it means to be a spouse, what it means to be a parent, what it means to be a child, as well as then finally ends in politics. What is our relationship to the government? At Helvetic, we're still living in times of kings and queens, right? And so there's magistrates, there's uh, very monarchical uh, power, 
right? And so um, it's important to realize there's no separation of church and state still at this point. In fact, the state is Christianity at this point. These Protestant churches are also um, aligned with Protestant kings and queens, right? And so it's important to understand how that works in a confession like this. And so they line out that part of the job of government, okay, is to exercise judgment by judging uprightly, protect widows, orphans, and the afflicted, punish criminals and oppressors. And man, when all attempts to preserve peace have been exhausted, to wage war. Okay, and so this is once again... Um, getting into things that the other confessions have not got into so far. There's a whole lot here. Um, it is huge amount of pages of the Second Helvetic Confession. I encourage you to read through it, to dive into it. If you don't want to read all of it, at least jump around in it and get a sense of how it relates all of these uh, concepts and topics together. I hope that you've learned something about the Second Helvetic Confession that you probably didn't even know existed up until this video today. Thanks for joining me.